6.9% of the Bangladesh population still smoke cigarettes, of which 40% are, are males. So the smoking prevalence amongst males in Bangladesh is much higher. Now compare that with the smoking prevalence in Sweden, which at the moment is 5.6%. Essentially, they have gone smoke free. We'd like to just show you a video on how they did it. And then we have a Swedish health leader, Dr. Anders Milton. We'll play you a few clips. And that's just to show you the case study of Sweden and smoke-free Sweden. The video, please. Bangladesh's goal of becoming a tobacco-free country by 2040 will be hindered if e-cigarettes are banned. To achieve this goal, the country should take a look at Sweden and the UK. Research from the UK has found that e-cigarettes are 95% less harmful than traditional cigarettes. The UK government has recently announced that it would distribute 1 million free vape kits to encourage adult smokers to quit traditional cigarettes. Sweden has one of the lowest smoking rates in the world. So low that this year, in 2023, it is set to become, according to official World Health Organization criteria, smoke-free. It's a goal that countries around the globe are aspiring to achieve by 2040. Most are on track to miss this target but Sweden will smash it by a staggering 17 years. In doing so, it will become the first nation that once smoked heavily to give up cigarettes. Sweden's smoking rate just 15 years ago was more than 150% higher than it is today. The Swedes have shown us the way to be safer and healthier, just like they did when they not only invented the three-point seat belt, but donated it to every car manufacturer in the world for free. The seatbelt has saved well over a million lives since a Volvo engineer came up with the idea in 1939. Sweden's latest public health miracle could save tens of millions of lives across every continent in the next decade alone, if we accept their latest gift to global public health. You see, the Swedes have effectively wiped out cigarette smoking by making much better alternatives as accessible, acceptable and affordable to consumers as possible. The results speak for themselves. Swedes have long used the less harmful snooze instead of cigarettes. But the introduction of more modern tobacco alternatives, vaping in 2015, and next generation nicotine patches, which followed in 2018, Tomo charged the smoking decline. In the last decade, smoking rates in Sweden have fallen by an astonishing 60%. The rest of the world's smoking rates are on average four times higher than Sweden's. Compared to the rest of the European Union alone, Sweden has 44% fewer tobacco-related deaths, a cancer rate that is 41% lower and 38% fewer deaths attributable to any cancer. If every other EU member state followed Sweden's example, up to 3.5 million European early deaths would be prevented in just one decade. And that just Europe. Yet Bangladesh is in danger of going in the opposite direction. The inclusion of e-cigarettes in the new Tobacco Control Act could detrimentally impact Bangladesh's goal of going tobacco-free by 2040. The chance to save millions of lives by following Sweden's example will be lost. World-renowned public health experts agree. I think we have the answer already. Tell the world about the Swedish experience and, and the, the mixture of, of pros and cons that we have had that have been helping people to leave cigarettes and get into something else. It's important to, for the governments to, to tell the consumers that if you if you need your daily nicotine use this instead of the cigarettes and this is sweden's gift to the global public health and why the message to the world when it comes to smoking quit like sweden smoke free sweden 2023 i mean the cigarette smokers would die from from smoking oh, half of them if we could get them on something else, so they get their daily nicotine and without, without dying, then we should do that.
-hmm. And I, I think that the Swedish government and, and the Swedish health agencies should be more uh, proactive in that sense, you know, and they should be more more vocal, you know, when it comes to our European sisters and brothers. I hope that uh, that the Swedish the Swedish government will tell the world about the Swedish experience and and the the mixture of, of pros and cons that we have had that have been helping people to leave cigarettes and get into something else. You know, when it comes to, to incidence of lung cancer, the Swedish figures are below the average of the European Union. And, and we think, I think, that the Swedish government should tell the world this. And, and the Swedish uh, health agencies should tell the world that we have, we have something that others don't have. Thank you, friends. Uh, that was the uh, voice of Dr. Anders Milton, who is a specialist physician, the former president of the Swedish Red Cross and the former secretary general of the Swedish Medical Association, explaining uh, the case study in Sweden as a country after Mariva so excellently did the same for New Zealand. So we will make all of these slides available to Voice of Vapor, Schumann, and to all of your members because it is relevant to the process that Bangladesh is going through. I'll just quickly flip through some of the slides that will be available. We've heard the story. They are becoming smoke-free. Um, we've seen that in comparison with other EU countries, Sweden is way ahead. Uh, in, in the EU, the average smoking prevalence is still 18%. Sweden 5.6. And if you look at the differences that Konstantinos also showed, uh, you would find that there is much lower uh, cancer, at least 44% less uh, tobacco deaths, 41% less cancer deaths in Sweden as in comparison with the rest of the EU. Uh, and you can also see that the number of smokers have changed. Also, don't forget what Konstantinos pointed out, is that it's not that the total intake of nicotine has changed, but it's just the delivery system. And then if you go on to how Sweden can help others quit, uh, it's basically what Hossi had mentioned as well, is you want affordable, acceptable, and, and uh, accessible alternatives. Um, what basically happened in Sweden is that, number one, the government allowed for the adoption of harm-reduced products. In Sweden's case, at first it was Swedish snus, but then vaping products came on board and then oral nicotine pouches. And they included the consumer in the engagement process. And that has brought them to the point where they are first in the world, world champions, in terms of being smoke-free. So if we can remember these four lessons from Sweden, then uh, it is definitely one of the case studies that would be relevant to Bangladesh. So thank you to Sweden and thank you to the speakers who highlighted the Swedish example, the New Zealand example, the United Kingdom example. I might add just one other country and that's the United States. The United States is the one country where by law, its Food and Drug Administration has to engage with all stakeholders. Yes. It's not illegal, it's, not, it's a required part of the process that consumers, scientists, even industry are invited to the table to discuss uh, what uh, proportionate regulation would look like. And we know the FDA has, over the last three years, approved some vaping products, some oral nicotine products as products that are allowed to be used on the U.S. market. So as we now enter the consumer section of this summit, um, let's keep these countries in mind. And uh, it's, it's a great joy for us to now ask Schumann as a representative of Voice of Vapors to introduce this consumer section along with Azra. Thank you. Thank you very much.
And now for our final session, we will discuss the consumer perspective of tobacco harm reduction. And to speak in this session, we have Michael Landl, the director of World Vapors Alliance, and Masud Zaman, convener of Voice of Vapors Bangladesh. Alongside them, joining us online, the CEO of We Are Innovation, Federico Fernandez. Let's begin the session. Federico. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last session of Bangladesh THR Summit 2023. While we had a great discussion on the science of tobacco harm reduction throughout the today, I think a consumer perspective could help us better understand THR from a completely different angle. With us today, we have Michael Landl, Director of World Vapors Alliance, and Federico Fernandez, the Executive Director of Summers Innovation and CEO of We Are Innovation, uh, joining us uh, online. I am Masudu Zaman, the convener of Voice of Vapors Bangladesh. I have the privilege of moderating this session. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself, um, uh, my connection to vaping, how I started and everything. So I have been a very heavy smoker for 27 years and I have been smoking approximately two packs a day. Uh, during this period of time, I tried to uh, quit many times. I tried to go cold turkey, which means I tried to quit without any support, any help. But I, I failed many times. And then I tried nicotine patches, and um, those didn't work for me as well. At a later point of time, I found um, vaping devices. Someone sent it to me from abroad, from USA, and um, I tried that one, and that worked for me. And it has been 10 years for me now, today, that I have been vaping, only vaping, and I have reduced my nicotine intake from throughout the journey of this 10 years from 18 milligrams down to 6 milligrams. And um, my consumption of nicotine has gone down as well. And I did not have to smoke one cigarette in 10 years. And Physically, health-wise, I feel way better. I'm, uh, I know myself that while I was smoking, how I was, and while I'm not smoking, I'm vaping, how I am today. So there are many, many, many benefits, not from vaping, but from absence of smoking, absence of combustible uh, smoke and the tar and the other chemicals. Uh, that actually is helping me. So having said that, I firsthand know the benefits of vaping and uh, many other uh, members of Voice of Vapors, they also know the benefits. There are people who have been vaping for five years, six years, seven years, eight years, or there are also new vapors who have started their journey. So um, today, I believe the number is about 7,500 who are members of uh, Voice of Vapors, but that doesn't show the number of vapors of Bangladesh. The Bangladeshi vapor now, uh, community, uh, Bangladeshi vapor number is uh, probably somewhere around 200,000 to 400,000. We don't know the actual number, but we can guess that it is more than 300,000. So this is how I quit smoking and came to vaping. And I have already covered the changes of my health. I even have x-rays of my lungs I had done while I, ha I was a smoker. And I had to do an x-ray post-COVID while I was a vapor. And, and I, just out of curiosity, I asked my physician to check both the x-rays of my lungs and he said yes there is 
significant change in your x-rays. Uh, while you were a smoker, your lungs were um, heavily uh, affected. Now uh, we can clearly see that it is trying to heal itself. So, but obviously 27 years of smoke, smoking damage doesn't go away completely. But there is evidence that my lungs are, have became to uh, cleanse as much as they could. So that, that, that actually um, confirmed my inner feelings or my physical uh, feelings that I, I understood from not smoking. So um, this is my journey. I just wanted to share it before I started. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Landl. Hi, Michael. You are currently uh, the director of World Vapors Alliance. Federico first. Federico. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Federico, you're online. I'm wearing my reading glass so I can understand that it's you. <laughs> so, um, Federico, um, uh, you, you are currently the executive director of Summer uh, Innovation and CEO of uh, We Are Innovation, which champions the idea of innovation over prohibition. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about these organizations and the goal of your activism? Hello, uh, Schumann and Lilon, and it's great to be with you. I, I would love to be with you in person, but unfortunately it was impossible for me to travel this time, but well, maybe next time, but, in, in the, but I'm very happy to at least be, be with you via Zoom. About our organization, We Are Innovation is, as you know, as the name clearly states, it's a, it's a pro-innovation alliance. We are, um, uh, our members are more than 35 think tanks, NGOs and foundations based in the US, Europe and Latin America. And hopefully soon we want to expand also to the, the Indo-Pacific region and the Middle East as well, in Africa. So we, we really want to become a, a global organization. And we are not, let's say, it's great to be here also with uh, people who, who are in the part of uh, the, 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 the users, let's say, of, um, of harm reduction products, but we are not, we are not an activist organization in, in these regards. And we are, let's say, we have several lines of, of interests and uh, innovation in nicotine is one of them. And just let me, let me tell you just a little bit why, why we ended up doing what we are doing regarding nicotine. When we started the organization roughly three and a half years ago uh, with, the, with the founding members, what we were trying to look for, as you know, innovation is a very wide field uh, and that's great. Uh, so we were trying to find areas which we thought were both very innovative, but also had a huge, a huge impact and improvement on human lives, on, on lives, you know, lives of people. I always say, and please, this is not against quantum computing at all, but I always say this, quantum computing is fantastic, but it's unlikely that my grandmother is thinking on the impact that quantum computing has in her life. But there are other areas, and I, like I said, uh, innovation in nicotine is one of them, that really the positive impact that you find on people's lives is, is amazing, is life-changing, and is life-saving in many cases. We are concerned with other topics as well, one of them, and, and let's say we are quite eclectic in our approach. One of the topics we, we've just published a, a report is fintech technology. As you may or may not know, approximately 50% of adults around the globe don't have a bank account with all the problems that that entails. So that is an area we really think that innovation can do a lot to, to solve our problems. We also are concerned with the sharing economy, with sustainable mobility, and another, um, and another key issue is innovation in nicotine. And I mean, uh, uh, Dillon was mentioned in the case of Sweden. In the case of Sweden, and, and, and in the cases of, of you, Schumann, what you just told us, yes. 
the, the impact that we see, the positive impact that we can have on people's lives is are amazing. And this is why we, we really like this topic and we are concerned with. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, your organization focuses on much more than just tobacco harm reduction, I can see that. So which aspect of uh, THR uh, drew you into this uh, conversation? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. Our, our, let's say, our angle on the, on the topic, let's say, is, is, let's say, innovation solving the problem of smoking. We felt, and it was our impression, that uh, there are still, the, I mean, the, this is not a, a feeling, this is a fact, I mean, there are more than a billion people who still smoke, and traditional approaches towards tobacco control needed, a, you know, an addition of innovation. In a sense, uh, Schumann, if you allow me, it's a slightly, you know, like the problem of, for instance, you know, uh, consuming meat or not. There are people that say, oh, meat is bad for the environment, therefore it should be banned because eventually, you know, it's going to produce a, a big problem or not. Regardless of what you think about this, there are many people who claim that. There are other people who think the same, but instead of trying to forbid meat, they are trying to create plant-based meat, a lab grown meat and we think the, the second kind of approach is the one that let's say is not moralistic but in the end ends up you know uniting ethics and efficacy and what we see in, in innovation in nicotine is exactly the same is an approach that is not prohibitionist is not moralistic in the worst meaning of the term but at the same hand is the most ethical and, and, and the one with the greatest efficacy. So we really think, let's say, it's a no-brainer. Thank you very much. Uh, while the uh, origin of your organization is in Latin America, but it's slowly expanding in Europe. Uh, in Europe, as we know, Sweden is set to become a smoke-free nation this year. Uh, in 15 years, the smoking rate in Sweden has come down to 5.6% from 15%. Uh, and the achievement has been credited to its tobacco harm reduction framework. Our pr Honorable Prime Minister has a vision of making Bangladesh a smoke-free nation by 2040. As a consumer and as an activist, do you think it is possible to become a smoke-free nation by banning reduced risk products while keeping traditional cigarettes legal. <laughs> yeah, I am not a consumer, neither an activist, but <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. no, I don't, <laughs> I don't I don't think no, I don't think that's it that that's possible. No. Like I, like I was saying, and if you want, um, as you prefer, please, you're you're the moderator, you're in charge, but I can also show you. A study that we did on X, I can show you a couple of slides of, of a study that we did on, yeah. on X smokers that um, currently use alternative nicotine products. But no, what, what, like I briefly mentioned, our, let's say our approach to this issue is the following. And again, we are not prohibitionists. We, let's say, but we, of course, uh, let's say, we acknowledge, like everyone does, that, you know, smoking is not the best you can do for your health. So, if we acknowledge that fact, and we are not prohibitionists, we think that the best approach is, there are, let's say, certain things regarding a tobacco control policy, the traditional way that are, uh, that, you know, seem to have worked to a certain extent, but we, we, we believe, and I think we think that Sweden really shows that, that the missing ingredient, the last piece of the puzzle is adding innovation in nicotine in order to, to solve this, this problem. And let's say that's what, we, what we've been advocating for quite a while, and that's what we think uh, the case of Sweden shows. Okay. Um, can you tell us some of the challenges you faced in Latin America and Europe while talking about tobacco harm reduction? Huh. That's a good question. I... You know, the challenges, I think, have to do with mis misinformation. But on the other hand, and I always like to focus on the positive, 
I think there are way more opportunities than threats nowadays in order to, to you know, to try to, to start a conversation about these issues. And one of the key, in, you know, key factors is what you said in your introduction of the, of the panel, Schumann. I am, in, in part, let's say, I have recognized the, 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 the huge impact, positive impact that these products have and, 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 and alternative nicotine products have thanks to the testimonies of, of former smokers who tried everything and they didn't succeed. And then they start vaping, for instance, and they, they start with other uh, alternative nicotine products and they do not touch a combustion cigarette ever again in their lives. So there are, of course, like in everything, there are challenges. We have been in contact with people who, let's say, are uh, way more challenged than us in the sense that they are the activists on the ground doing, doing the work. We, we work with a lot of uh, activist organizations. We have done a documentary about you know, activism in, in Latin America, by the way, called Behind the Cloud that you can find on our YouTube channel. It's just, you know, after the event, you can, you can watch a magnificent okay. documentary. It's, it's in Spanish, but it has subtitles in English. Um, but I think there are way more opportunities than, than, than challenges. What Dylan mentioned, the case of Sweden, what the UK has been doing, New Zealand. This year, you know, of course, by the end of the year, there will be the COP and only God knows what's going to happen there. Let's hope nothing too terrible. But there are a lot of things that I believe are aligning in favor of uh, safer products as the missing ingredient to solve the puzzle of uh, smoking. Thank you. Um, about uh, the scenario in your country, it's Argentina, right? So um, uh, let me add that I'm a big fan of Argentine football. And of course, thank yeah, you. You, yeah, you, you yeah. are our greatest fans and Argentina should play one match at least every year in Bangladesh. Um, at least one. At least one. And yeah, so <laughs> I, and I should get a front ticket, front row <laughs> ticket. So anyways, uh, even when consumers have been in favor of vaping. The product has been banned due to the push of certain groups spreading misinformation. That was the case in Argentina. And now people are acquiring them illegally, which means quality cannot be ensured and the government cannot collect tax from the sale of such products. Do you think this prohibition has done more harm than good. <laughs> See, no, definitely. I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know any, any seller, any illegal seller who cares about the quality and or the age of the order <laughs> of the buyers of the product, you know, really. <laughs> we should know this by now. No, definitely. This has been, the, the story of Argentina is, is, is complicated. Uh, the, the prohibition is quite old. Argentina, unfortunately, was, a, I wouldn't say a pioneer, but almost forbidding vaping uh, more than 10 years ago now for, for something, let's say, for a very strange episode that happened with somebody trying to import products. It, it doesn't matter, but it was, it was extremely weird. It was banned by the, 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 what would be the local FDA. If you ask me, honestly, you know, overreaching what they can do, but it doesn't matter. It's there and now it's difficult. However, the vaping community in Argentina, I mean, as you, as you mentioned, you, it's difficult to have, I mean, there are no official numbers, but the vaping, the vaping community in Argentina is quite large. There are uh, Aso Vape Argentina, claims, and I think with good reason, that currently there are between eight, between 800,000 and a million citizens vaping in Argentina. So, and it's growing because it's, it's been a, a very good alternative in order to quit smoking for people who couldn't quit otherwise. So there are, there's that, which is a huge constituency, 
which is uh, making you know their voice heard. And there is the other issue that there are a couple of um, bills in, in the parliament to be treated and voted hopefully soon that want to uh, create an environment of smart regulation open to innovation, not the, and you know finalize the current scenario, which is that vaping in Argentina is treated as if it were plutonium, basically. <laughs> that you cannot sell it, you cannot buy it, you cannot import, you cannot export. It's, it, it's, it's ridiculous. So hopefully, perhaps this year, we have good news from Argentina. There are other countries in the region. I don't want to say much, not to spoil it. But there are, there are other countries in the region that may may have good, may bring good news in the in the future so we are quite optimistic regarding this uh, in the case of argentina there is the the project uh, the, the bill sorry presented by ricardo lopez murphy who by the way participated in in our in in one event of, of ours last year uh, by the end of the year talking about these issues he's a member of parliament and, and his his bill is is the kind of project we we like to support. It's an open bill that you know creates certain, of course, limitations for these products in the sense that, of course, they cannot be purchased by minors and things like that. But also, it's a project that it uh, creates a smart regulations in our environment and it's open to future innovations because that's the other thing we should never forget. Uh, this is not we are, we are not at the end stage. This is not the end game. This is we have let's say four innovative products regarding uh, to, to fight smoking, which, you know, are snooze, which is a magnificent innovation. <laughs> even even it's, it's old, but it's, it's, it's magnificent. It's banned in most of the country, in, in the whole EU, by the way, to, to, to begin with. You have snooze, you have nicotine pouches, you have uh, vaping, and you have heated tobacco. Those four have proven that they, let's say, they have they are extremely powerful in order to help us uh, solve the the smoking uh, problem. We don't know what could come in the future, so we we always have to be open to whatever comes that it's even better, let's say, than vape, than vaping, and can even be even more efficient at the time of of uh, for for smoking cessation. So we we should always keep that that those doors and those windows open as well. Schumann, if I may uh, suggest, yes, Michael please. Landl will, may, will not be able to join online. Okay. But he's left us all free t shirts at the World Vaping Alliance yes. stand. Yes. Uh, Federico, if I may ask if you can stay on, because we are now going to have our last panel, and if you could be part of that, please. So if we can have the two chairs for Konstantinos and Mariva, and then uh, while we fix the chairs here, uh, Federico, your organization did a consumer perception study in Sweden, as it happens. Uh, but these consumer perception studies are useful indicators of how consumers make choices and why. And we've touched on several, Konstantinos and Mariva, in both of their sessions, they, they, they spoke about that. So I suggest that uh, if you could perhaps take us through your survey results, and then after that, we'll have our last panel together, if that's Absolutely. okay with you, yes. Because my question to Federico was all, already uh, all okay. answered. And I think let's uh, do as you have okay. already suggested. So please, fire away, uh, Federico. Happily. Just let me share my screen. And let's see. And ah, that's it. Good. I'll go very, very quickly because I don't want to, let's say, monopolize or talk more than I was supposed to. Just uh, very quickly, we did, uh, as Dylan said, we did an opinion poll in Sweden because, you know, let's say this is the year of Sweden and of people who used to smoke and now have turned to uh, alternative uh, nicotine products in order to stop smoking. We wanted to, to, to know their view. As I said, to us, this is, let's say, this is a no brainer. Um, traditional tobacco control may has may have its 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 lights and, and its shadows, as we would say in 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 Spanish. There are certain things that uh, have worked to a certain extent, but this is the this is the the missing piece. This is the missing piece of the puzzle. The missing piece of the puzzle is to allow innovators to try to improve our lives as they do in everything else, basically. So. 
Uh, and we wanted to know what consumers of these kinds of products think in Sweden, since Sweden has been so uh, successful in order to eliminate smoking. Very quickly, one thing, I mean, this is not going to be a, a, a surprise for anyone, but let's say it's important to highlight why people stopped smoking and turned into alternative nicotine products, into innovative products, because of health concerns. That's by far the, um, the most important reason. There are other um, uh, factors that may influence the decision, such as uh, the social aspect and also financial aspects. I'll go to some of these differences very quickly in a couple of slides, but let's say health, the most important, um, the most important uh, reason by far. The other thing that we, that we detected is that, like I said, there is, we are not in a non plus ultra scenario. I mean, we don't know what would come in the future, but we know what we have now and again, it's not wise to pick, let's say, winners and losers or pick one product over the other. It's better that, you know, we let adults to decide what, uh, what fits them. You know, the one size fits all is not the best policy. It usually never is. And in this case, it's, it's not, uh, uh, again, it's not, the, it's not the case at all. There are differences between ages, between different groups, and particularly there are certain uh, differences between women and men that should be highlighted. And uh, about women, in, in, in Sweden, snus is still the most popular product, but if we go overall, but if we go to, to, to women in particular, women are, uh, their, 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 product, their, pref their preferred product are nicotine pouches, not snus, and by far. And vaping, for instance, is twice as popular as in men regarding women. So, this really shows us that gender sensitivities should be uh, taken into consideration. And this, I mean, from this, this is a very, let's say, humble opinion study done by Ipsos, by the way, which is a very important company. But we can, and I'm not saying, just, I mean, as an intellectual exercise, we can start thinking of extrapolating certain, you know, the gender differences could be also extrapolated into cultural differences for other countries into, so again, it's, we should. I, I would never recommend to pick one product and uh, forget about the rest. It's better. It's. I mean, it's. It's better. You know, to, of course, to to favor harm reduction some way. But let's say a variety. I think it's. A, it's part of the of the Swedish recipe. Another very important factor. Three things I want to highlight very quickly. Flavors um, and nicotine levels are very important. Uh, both women and men say that, and I'll go with the women again in the next slide, but it's, it, these are extremely important. And the other point, the, the third uh, line that you see uh, top to bottom is how affordable, how competitive the price of alternative nicotine products is compared to combustion cigarettes. And this, again, has to force us to think about how these products, products are taxed, is, is the level you know, of, of safety or of risk, of risk as you want to, to measure it, is represented regarding taxes. If these products are taxed uh, as uh, if they were combustion tobacco, it's, it's a big problem. I mean, some of these products don't even have tobacco, even though many people forget about that. But uh, so this, again, creating, let's say, a, an environment that allows for competitive price and taxation according, according risks. I think it, it's very important and the Swedish consumers tend to agree. Very, very quickly, and I'll, and I'll be wrapping up. Women uh, were, let's say, very vocal, for instance, regarding that flavors for them are very important. According to you know, when we, when we uh, divide this, uh, these responses according to gender, 50% of women said that flavors, to be able to find the, the product in the flavor they want is very important in compared to 37% of men. And in the case of, nico of nicotine levels, more than a third of women said that they, it was very important to find the products uh, according to that as well, while less than a quarter of men said that it was very important. 
Last but not least, and this was, let's say, the most puzzling issue that we, that we found, uh, asked, when we asked the ex-smokers what were the, what, what were the perceptions they, they, they have regarding certain, you know, institutions and the society itself, you know, let's say how, how they thought government perceived these products, how they thought public health institutions and, and society, it's, let's say it's a bittersweet, more bitter than sweet uh, scenario. In the case of government, I mean, only 15% think that it's uh, positive and, and 20, 24% even th think the government is hostile. 61, a big, the, the greatest majority, I mean, thinks that it's, uh, it's neutral. This could have, a, um, you know, created perhaps a less fair uh, environment that could be, could be positive. But I'll, and I'll finish with the next slide and maybe there is something that the Swedish government could do slightly better. The, the, the role of, of public health institutions is, is not perceived very well. 46% find them that they are hostile followed by 45% neutral, positive only, only uh, nine. And it's very interesting that society, the, the views are way better, but they are still not, not great. The Swedish consumers would like the government of Sweden to change its approach and be more supportive. And I think they definitely have a point. And this support should not translate it into subsidies or anything like that. We're not talking about this. But, and with this, I finish. The, the, the video that, that Dylan showed us talked about the uh, three point seatbelt that has saved so many lives. And that was a gift that Sweden gave to the world. I think that uh, the Swedish character is, uh, let's say, it's a, it's a, they, they, they are magnificent people. They, they, they tend to be sometimes slightly too more humble than they, than they should be. But in this case, they should change that because this is another major gift they could give, be given to other countries, to humanity as a whole. And it's important that it's, a, it's known everywhere. And it's known that Sweden had not stopped nicotine, but had stopped burning tobacco in order to consume nicotine. And that has been a big part of what the Swedish uh, have achieved. So. With this I finish, I'll, I'll stay for, for the panel and thank you for, very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Federico. A round of applause for Federico. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we come to the last panel of our session today and I ask please Konstantinos and Mariva to join uh, Schumann on, on stage. And what the intention is with this last session is the people of Bangladesh do not necessarily want to hear all about the United Kingdom or Sweden or Japan or Germany. Uh, they want to know what, what is applicable for Bangladesh now and for the next five years. And you've heard excellent presentations this morning about the policy making process, the scientific basis for policy. Uh, and we've had Mariva explaining to us uh, how we could also use New Zealand as one of those case studies. So I'm going to invite our thinkers to join me on stage so that we can have a last 10 minute session on applying what we've learned today to Bangladesh. There we go. Do you have mics? So the exam question is, now that you've heard all these presentations today, Mariva, uh, what are your final thoughts and what would your recommendations be on all the key stakeholders in Bangladesh on accelerating tobacco harm reduction in Bangladesh? 
There's definitely a complex uh, context in Bangladesh with the uh, government's investment, if that is still the case, in tobacco companies, in the manufacturing, and a lot of people, families and communities growing tobacco, that Bangladesh is you know, one of the largest consumers of tobacco in the world and has 20 million people smoking. And then there's uh, about half of men chew tobacco or use, the, use tobacco in chewing products. The uh, rolling of BD, uh, the industry around that giving uh, low income people uh, income. And just generally the immense task of, you know, progressing the nation, building industry, healthcare and other government services. There's obviously a lot for the government to weigh up and, and I think there's a lot of pressure on the government as well to ban these alternatives that will save lives. Eventually, reducing disease and premature death will reduce the cost for the government in terms of health care. So it is, it is complex when there are so many issues and there is diversity and there are many groups uh, with different smoking prevalence, different tobacco use patterns and different products being used. It's much more complex than our situation in New Zealand. Konstantinos, and if we could pass the mic to you. What have you learned today and how has your opinion been changed? Well, I think that one of the reasons why we brought up the examples of other countries is to show to the regulators in Bangladesh that we're not talking about creating a revolution here. It's something that has been done in other countries. It has been tested. They won't be even the first in Asia to do it because Philippines have been the first to regulate e-cigarettes, in my opinion, in a very appropriate way. And the same should be applied to all other products. But due to the size of the country and uh, other geopolitical reasons, they can be leaders in Asia, you know. And they can do something very different from their neighbors, which I'm pretty confident that they made a very bad choice and they're going to pay the price, unfortunately, the society, but also the government due to the lack of control of an illicit market that they have created. Uh, we need to learn from the good things that other countries have done and also from the bad choices of other countries, particularly neighboring countries. And that should be the guide to move forward. Uh, I know that these products and the whole concept sounds, you know, innovative and that creates some fear among regulators, but this is not the case. Harm reduction is a strategy, as I said, that we apply daily in our lives. It's nothing revolutionary. It's the only thing that makes sense, especially in a country where there is no investment in helping people quit smoking by other methods. In fact, it's the only tool that remains and will not cost any money to the government. Probably they will get some money from taxing the products for commercial use, uh, taxing retail, I mean, or even creating a local industry with export capacity. But in terms of public health, it can become a revolution if it is regulated appropriately. And appropriate regulation definitely does not mean a ban. It definitely also does not mean restrictions similar to tobacco cigarettes. Uh, it's going to be a long process. We saw that it took Sweden some 30 years in order to achieve the results that they have achieved. It's not something easy, it's not something that's going to happen in one day. But the right way to start with this approach is first to understand that this is a tool that will solve the smoking problem, and not a part of the smoking problem, it's part of the solution to the smoking problem. It's the only thing, I repeat, that makes sense to endorse and 
regulate with fewer restrictions the least lethal products and restrict the most lethal products. This is what makes sense. This is a risk proportionate policy that every regulator follows throughout the world for any regulatory matter. Uh, so I think that the prospects are huge. Uh, the burden of smoking related disease is tremendous in Bangladesh. Uh, and it's not only smoking, but also the use of other oral tobacco products. And they have a solution that will not cost money to the government, does not need any investment and any preparation, can be implemented immediately, as long as smokers in, uh, and users of other tobacco products in Bangladesh have appropriate and reliable information in order to make informed choices and decisions. You know, Harm reduction is in reality a human right. Because if you look at the WHO Ottawa Charter in 1986 about empowerment in health, it dictates that people should have, should have the information and the tools to improve their own health. And it's a bad decision to deprive smokers from a, a perfect tool, harm reduction, an almost perfect tool, um, as an addition to all the other measures, as a supplement, um, and not um, to uh, abandon all other methods. But especially here, I think it can be the prevailing method, and it perfectly fits to the smoke-free vision of the Bangladesh government for 2040. And I think that only through tobacco harm reduction they will be able to uh, achieve the goal that they have set for themselves. Thank you, Konstantinos. We have two minutes, two or three minutes left, and it's only good uh, to have the representative of Voice of Vapors to address us, and perhaps especially address the issue of flavors uh, and the role of flavors in Bangladesh and the yes. vapors in Bangladesh. Yes. Um, actually, today's session uh, has been uh, extremely educative for me. And I, I, th I consider myself uh, privileged to be able to experience uh, such people uh, uh, share their experiences and knowledges with us. And it is uh, <clears throat> something that we can actually use for our country. And um, I think we should learn from the examples of the uh, other success stories of other countries and also learn from the bad choices that has been made and what uh, uh, what they have the, the what kind of sufferings the people the vapors and the smokers everybody is going through due to some policies mm -hmm. so what are those policies it, it was actually very simple uh, to me if you ask me uh, reducing not banning at all. Banning is out of the table. The, the taxation should be reduced to um, such a level which is actually um, bearable. Right now, our tax is 212. It is abs absolutely, uh, I would say, outrageous tax. It is kind of telling you that we don't want this product in the country. But if we believe in the product, if we think that it is harm reduction, why would we discourage the product? We should actually encourage the product. The tax could be, I don't know, 7%, 10%, 15%, just a number I'm saying. But it should be a rational taxation. And um, government does not need to invest. We are not requesting any sort of investment from them. We just want uh, rational policies from them. We just want some level of tolerance from them. And the rest are, are work in progress, which are being done by the customers and by the traders. Just help them with proper policies. Don't shut the door on their faces. Don't make their life impossible, so much impossible that they have to go back to smoking, which is already from today's uh, session, everybody already knows that this is harm reduction. It simply means that tobacco is more dangerous. Mm -hmm. In our country, we are keeping 
tobacco uh, legal, but we are uh, uh, asking to ban the only tool that we can actually come out of smoking. It doesn't make sense. And I think um, there is no alternative of dialogue and there should be enough dialogue with the stakeholders, with the consumer representatives, with the trader representatives, and with the healthcare professionals. Um, there should be more dialogue before, before setting a mind uh, that, yes, I need to ban it, or yes, I need to promote it. So I think that, that part has not been addressed yet. So um, that is where we should start now instead of banning it outright. Well, uh, I will disagree with something you said. You asked for tolerance from the government. In my opinion, I think that the government should ask you for help. <laughs> Don't laugh. Yeah, yeah. This is happening in the UK. Absolutely In true. the UK, the vapors and the vaping retail market is acting as, as uh, uh, smoking cessation services. That's exactly how they act. In the UK, the government has opened vape shops, they are private, of course, inside hospitals. Yes. I, inside I the hospital, inside the building of a hospital, not close to the building, inside the building. Why? Because this is what will motivate smokers to switch. The UK government and the public health authorities have acknowledged that vape shops in the UK act like smoking cessation centers. And knowing that the Bangladeshi government has set a goal to become smoke free in 2040, as I said, they should be asking vapors and the retail market for help in order to convince, to inform, communicate and convince smokers to try to make a switch to less harmful products. So you don't need tolerance. You need common sense, as you said, and after that, the government should cooperate with the consumers and with the retail industry and make every vape shop a smoking cessation center, a center for informing smokers about these products, providing proper, balanced and reliable information about the knowns and the unknowns, and let them decide for themselves. As for the taxation that you mentioned, I fully agree with you and we should not forget that these are technology products. So by definition, they are much more expensive to be produced. Therefore, applying the same tax as for a tobacco product, and we know that tobacco products are extremely cheap to make, yes. is basically creating a competitive advantage for tobacco cigarettes which is the exact opposite from what we want. We don't want to unintentionally, of course, I don't believe that there is any intention from the regulators, we don't want to unintentionally protect tobacco. the status quo, which is tobacco cigarette sales. I'm sure that's not their goal, that's not their intention, but unfortunately their decisions and their approach is indirectly and unintentionally protecting the status quo, which is tobacco cigarette sales. And I'm certain that they don't want that. And we need to make that clear that there is only w one way to stop protecting the tobacco cigarette sales, and that is to endorse harm reduction products among smokers. This is what the UK has done. It may appear as revolutionary maybe 10 years ago when they started doing that, but not today. Today, it's been... 10 years, I think it was 2014 that they started doing that in the UK. We've seen the results, an unprecedented reduction in smoking rates in the UK, millions of vapors, no pro health problems among vapors. They have, of course, the health problems of a former smoker because quitting smoking doesn't mean that your risk goes to zero to the same level as a non-smoker immediately. It takes years, and that's why we shouldn't delay making yes. these decisions. Uh, delaying such decisions costs lives. So they need your assistance as consumers because you have the knowledge, you have the understanding, 
and you can communicate this understanding to all other smokers. And that has been the case everywhere in the world. These products were never developed and were not invented by big corporations. There were no marketing campaigns. There were nothing in uh, 2008 when they first were released in the market. It was by word of mouth from one user to the other that everyone knew about the product. And this is exactly what happened to me when I first started doing my research in 2011. I had no idea about these products. I couldn't find any marketing material. I just spoke with vapors in a vapors group, online group that I found in Greece. And that's how I started doing my research on the subject. This is what works. And this is where you can help the government achieve their goal becoming smoke-free in 2040. Thank you, Konstantinos. I think he even we need to give him a round of applause for that passionate plea. And the last word is to you, Mariba. Thank you. Did you turn it off? Uh, no, no. Okay. I just wanted to add, um, because you brought up about the tax, New Zealand has zero tax on vaping products. It's, and this is because smoking is highest among the lowest income groups. And you need to create that advantage. So the cost savings are significant. You know, if you have both parents smoking, uh, families, well, one person will save 100 New Zealand dollars. That would be about 50, 60 US dollars a week, a week. And if both parents smoke, which is the case for some of our people, where the mothers smoke as well, $200 New Zealand a week. So it is significant. It's a significant motivator to, to stop smoking among people who were happy smoking and, you know, didn't, didn't want to quit. So, yeah, I think, I think the other thing that we have learned as we've visited Philippines and, and, and other countries it's very important, obviously, that Bangladesh, you understand your country the best, you understand your people, your peoples, and it's, it's up to you to make that decision. And there are significant global powers that are trying to influence countries in making the decision to ban alternatives and you, you know, you can't fathom why would they ban a product that is going to save lives. It was a determining factor in why Philippines, in the end, made their own decision to regulate rather than ban. They were being encouraged to ban, and they found out that there was uh, funding from overseas organizations that were trying to interfere in their sovereign process. So do watch out for that. And you know, we're just here to share the science and information. It's up to you, you know, the Bangladeshi people to make that decision. But yeah. On that note, thank you very much, Mariva. Thank you very much, Konstantinos. And may I, on behalf of the audience, thank Schumann and Voice of Vapors, the production team under Sakib, uh, Navis, uh, Asra, a, a round of applause to all of them. And then our summit isn't over. We have nice eats at a time where we can have discussions with one another. But the formal presentations of the summit is now concluded. And I'd like to thank all of the speakers and all of the participants in being here and wish Bangladesh all of the best to become smoke-free in 2040, but using the right pathway. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you very much.